Hey there. So Blender 4.3 is released and it comes packed with a lot of new features. That also goes for geometry nodes. To give you a good overview of what these new features are and how you should best go about using them, I want to walk you through them in this video. So first up, there are gizmos. That's right, the fancy little widgets that you have in your 3D viewport to control objects and manipulate them are coming to nodes as well now. For now, that doesn't directly mean much for the average user, but it's more aimed at geometry nodes users that are building their own tools to give them the ability to build those tools in a way that they're interactive in the 3D viewport. Down the road, more and more tools that are built into Blender will also have their own gizmos coming out of the box. So in the end, users that just use geometry nodes hidden away behind the modifier interface will be able to benefit from these gizmos, but also geometry nodes users that build their own custom node trees will be able to use these gizmos to manipulate the effect of the nodes themselves in the 3D viewport. So let's go a little bit over how that works. At the moment, there are just three different gizmo nodes, the linear gizmo, dial gizmo, and the transform gizmo. Essentially, what these gizmos do is just provide you with a different interface to control values. Let's build a basic example for a grid plane. First of all, let's add the linear gizmo node. On its own, it doesn't really do much yet. It just provides us with the interaction for this arrow in the 3D viewport, but it does not control anything. And in the end, it just snaps back to its original position, which is given in the linear gizmo position input. And other than you might expect, there is not an output giving us the value that the gizmo changes. Instead, there is just an input socket, which will affect what the gizmo controls. So to actually control the size of the grid, we need some other value that we can control with the gizmo. For now, let's just add in a value input node. And this we can then connect to the grid input for the size x parameter, and also to the gizmo. Now that the value input of the gizmo is connected to something, you can see that there is a double line drawn instead of the regular link between them. This communicates that there is now a different kind of connection happening. So information from the gizmo is basically flowing back to this value node. So when I now interact with the arrow, you can see it changes the value here. This way of controlling values with gizmos in the nodes might seem a little bit convoluted at first, but you will see later how this is very useful. Okay, so since this gizmo is supposed to control the size of the grid in the x dimension, let me fix up the position and the direction inputs of the gizmo. Let's use a combine xyz node and plug the value that we're controlling in the x input and then use that for the position. For the direction, we can just type in 1, 0, 0. You will also notice that the gizmo does not always just show up. It depends on the context. The behavior is a bit different depending on whether or not you have a node editor open. With a node editor, the gizmos will only show up if you have the node selected that corresponds to them. So either the gizmo node itself or the node that they're controlling. If you always just want to see the gizmo, you can also toggle this checkbox. Since the grid is in the center of the object, the position of the gizmo should actually be half of the size. So let's add a multiply node right here to multiply with 0.5. And now it's in the correct spot. But if I interact with the gizmo now, you can see that it doesn't stay attached to the size, only if I let go. The reason for that is that the position is correct, but while I'm interacting with it, how much the value changes depending on my movement is derived from what is happening between the value I am controlling and the gizmo. And the value that I want to control interactively in the viewport is not actually the full size, but half of it. So if now instead of the value directly, we connect the output of this multiply node, you can see that the double links still end up at this input node, but they flow through the multiply node. And when I interact with it, now everything stays attached as it moves. So Blender tries to smartly figure out the relationship between your interaction and the value that you're interacting with. This works for all sorts of simple math relationships like multiplying, adding, and so on quite nicely. And the flow of information always takes the first input of a node. So here, now you can see that the value that is controlled with the gizmo is the first input of the math node or whatever is connected to that first input.
All right, so let's do the same thing for the Y direction. I'm just going to duplicate the setup, plug this into Y, change the direction, and reconnect the size. And now we already have the setup for both directions. We can quickly give the different arrows the correct colors. Next, I want to turn this into a handy little node group. So I'll just select these nodes, press Ctrl G, and there we go. Now that this is part of a node group, the values of the node group itself can also be driven with the gizmos. So if I get rid of these input nodes and just leave the node group on its own, you can see that controlling the gizmos will directly control these values. So we nicely have contained the gizmos inside of this node group and can just use them like this. And here again, only the gizmos for the active node will show up in the viewport. But if I go one step further and expose these as group inputs to the modifier level, so that they show up here, even if now we get rid of the node editor, we'll be able to control these parameters from the 3D viewport for the active object and its active modifier. This makes it very convenient when you're using a modifier that is set up with gizmos in this way. But for now, let's open the node editor back up and make some changes to the setup. First of all, I want to clean this up a little bit. We can actually duplicate this group input and just connect the size X and Y values directly from here. So we have two parts of the node tree that are a little bit split up. The main data flow with the grid and then the gizmo information down here. I want to be able to control both of the X and the Y scale with a single gizmo that goes diagonally to scale up the plane. You can easily have multiple gizmos control the same values or also one gizmo control multiple values. To get the gizmo I just mentioned, let's duplicate one of the linear gizmo nodes. And for now, let's just connect it to both of these. So you can see if I change this gizmo, it affects both the X and the Y size. For the position, we can just add the positions of the X and the Y together. And we can also use that for the direction. But you can see, just like we had it before, it doesn't quite stick. The reason for that is simply that since this is a rectangle, the ratio of changing the X and the Y size should depend on the dimensions of this rectangle. To fix this, unfortunately, we need to do a little bit of trigonometry. To get the correct ratio between the X and the Y component, we can just use an arctangent. Let's go with arctan2, so we can connect the X and the Y component like this. And this way, we essentially get the angle of this arrow. So to get the correct ratios, now we just need a sine and a cosine. And to apply these ratios correctly, we just need to divide the values that we want to control by the sine and the cosine, respectively. And there you go. Now everything is perfectly attached, no matter what the ratio is. All right, let's quickly go over another gizmo type and add some more functionality to this. Let's add a geometry transform node and switch the mode to matrix so we can control this with a transform gizmo. Again, we need something to control. So let's add a combined transform node, which combines a translation, rotation, and scale into a matrix output. And this transform output, we can just connect both to the transformation and the gizmo. And when I then select the transform gizmo, you can see that it already works. But there is something going wrong. The gizmos that we previously had for the size of the grid are not attached properly anymore. The reason for that is that they are not actually attached to the geometry of the grid. But there is a simple way to change that. You might have already noticed that there is a transform geometry output on the gizmo nodes. So far, we haven't been using that. This output is actually a tool to attach the transform information of the gizmo to a geometry, exactly for cases like this. So if I make a little bit of space and then add a join geometry node, we can join all of the outputs of the gizmo nodes to the geometry of the grid. And now you can see that Blender is clever enough to figure out that these are attached to the grid and should follow the same transformation. We should also do the same thing here for the transform node afterwards. Since we're already controlling the size of the grid with the custom gizmo, I don't want to expose the scale operations of this transform. So in the node settings, let's just turn all of them off. This way, we can only control the rotation and translation of the grid with this gizmo. To make this nicely contained in the node group, let's also create inputs for those. Now that these are exposed, we should also hook them up to the position and rotation of the transform gizmo. So now if I go outside of the node group, you can see we have a nice little asset to control the dimensions, 
and rotation and translation of this grid very easily. But the transform gizmo right now is not actually following the rotation as we set it up. The reason for that is that the transform orientation setting in the viewport is set to global. If we change this to local, it will accurately change into the transform that we set, like this. Next up, there's the for each element zone. Since the beginning of implementing geometry nodes, people have been asking for loops to iterate over different elements of a geometry. And even though we already had the repeat zone in geometry nodes for a couple of releases, now there's a new zone that allows you to iterate over the geometry in a completely different way. The repeat zone is essentially just a serial loop to copy over the same functionality in succession a dynamic number of times. The for each element zone works a bit differently and then it executes the same functionality for each element of a geometry. And that can happen in parallel. So what that means is that you can iterate over the elements of a geometry, so the points, faces, edges, and so on, to execute the same functionality and then output everything together merged into one geometry. In this example here, I'm creating a tree library this way by just having a grid of a bunch of points and then executing the tree generator once for each point while randomizing the inputs. Doing this wouldn't have been possible in this way before, it would have been a lot more complicated to achieve. So let me just quickly go over the details of how this zone works. To show the for each element zone, let's go over how to create this kind of library of randomized trees. Let's start out by using the grid plane asset that we just created for the gizmos. The only thing that I added on top was an additional gizmo to control the resolution. This resolution is going to be controlling the amount of trees that we're generating. Because what we're going to do with the for each element zone is iterate over all of the individual points of this grid. So let's get started doing that by first of all adding the for each element zone. As all the other zones in Blender, it comes with an input node and an output node. And they already have a couple of settings. First of all, let's connect the grid plane with the input. And on the input node, you can see that we can select the different domains to control what kind of element we want to iterate over. In our case, the points will do just fine. In case we would want to limit this to only a specific selection of points, we have the input right here. So now whatever we do inside of this zone will be executed once for each individual point of this geometry. And in this case, I want to generate one tree for each point. For now, let's just create a cube so I can show you the basics. When I just add this, it's not actually part of the zone yet because it's not connected to anything. You need to connect it to the output of the zone. Now, right away, there are two different lists of outputs. There are the main outputs where the main geometry is going to be passed back out. So if I connect this to the output of the modifier, you can see this is just the grid plane that we plugged in to the zone in the beginning. But here we have the option to add additional attributes to attach to the geometry. But instead of the main geometry, we want to generate new geometry in this case. So let's connect the output to this additional geometry output socket. This one has an equivalent on the inside of the zone. And if I connect the cube here, it pops up right there. If we go ahead and inspect the geometry in the spreadsheet editor, you'll notice that this is not actually a single cube, but a cube for every single point of the grid just all in the same place. All the cubes for the individual points are merged together in this geometry output. Now let's get them all in the correct places. For that, we need to access the position of each individual point and then move each cube into the right space. Let's just use the transform geometry node for that. To get the position of each individual point, we need to use the position input node and then pass it in from the outside of the zone. This will make sure that the position is stored on each point and then passed into the zone as a value. You can see here because of the shape of the socket that on the outside of the zone, this is actually an attribute, so a different vector for each point. On the inside though, we are only dealing with one point at a time. So here, this will always just be a single value for each point. And that means you can actually connect it to the translation of the transform node. And as I connect it, you can see that all of the cubes jump into place. If I select the grid plane, we even still have access to the gizmos. Now that we have the basics set up, let me replace this cube with the birch node group that I have prepared. This is just a simple tree generator node group. 
and it also comes with some gizmos attached. But right now we're just generating the exact same tree every single time, and that's not the point. What I want to do is randomize this. So something that we can very easily do is just use the index of the point for each iteration of creating a birch. And this way we already get some variation. But on top of just changing the seed, we can also change the other input parameters. So let's use a random value node. And then we can connect it, for example, to the branch start. But right away we get an invalid link. The reason for that is that the ID input uses a field by default. But here we need to make sure to output a single value. So we can just replace the ID input with the index. And now we get some random variation of the branch start for each tree. So let's just use a reasonable range. And then I want to do the same for the height. But the height, if I go into the birch node group, you can see it can still be controlled with the gizmo. So if I just replace it with a random value, I won't be able to do that anymore, since there is nothing to be controlled. To keep this control available, instead of connecting the height directly to a random value, we can just use a multiply node. And instead of connecting the random value to the first input, which propagates the gizmo, we just connect it to the second one. So now we still have control, as well as randomization. And because of the way that the gizmos are set up, everything just works and is attached properly. And we can still just select the initial grid plane and control with our gizmo how this library is supposed to be set up. Now lastly, I want to go over some additional aspects of the zone output. Instead of outputting all of these birch meshes in one single geometry, turn them all into individual instances. For that we can just use the geometry to instance node. Now each birch tree is its own instance of a mesh. And you can see a list right here in the spreadsheet editor. And our output geometry contains these 64 instances. And with these extension sockets, we can add additional information as attribute data on the output geometry. So for example, if I connect the actual height that has been randomized in the zone to create a new socket here, on the outside, we get information about the height of the individual trees on the instance domain as an attribute. But to make that work properly, we need to go to the node settings and then change the domain to instance to match our output. And then if I connect a viewer set to instance, you can see right here in the spreadsheet that now every single tree also outputs its actual height as attribute information. By clicking while holding control, you can easily rename this in the node interface. It's also useful to know that you can output multiple sets of joined geometry together. If you do that, it creates this separator line. The reason for that is that all of the attributes you output belong always to the previous geometry output. So the order of them matters. But that's it for now for the for each element zone. One last thing to mention is that there are also different types of for each zones planned. Like for example, to iterate over different parts of a mesh, like mesh islands. But do consider that using any kind of loops in your node interface is likely going to come with some performance penalty. So whenever you can solve a problem without using the for each element zone, it's probably more efficient to do so. Just keep that in mind. Another new feature is that you can now name your geometry from within geometry nodes to get a better overview in the spreadsheet editor. We can get a good overview of what that means by slightly adjusting the tree library setup. So right now in the spreadsheet editor, it's a bit hard to have an overview of all these different trees. So let's give them all an individual name. So let's add the set geometry name node right before we turn it into an instance. And for now, let me just set this to birch. And now you can already see how all of these trees are now named birch. So let's use the value to string node. You can set this to integer and then connect the index. So this way we just get the number of the birch as the name. With a join strings node, we can now add this together with just the string birch, and we have ourselves a nice readable name. For the delimiter, I'm just going to use a space input. And then lastly, let's just add one to the index. So we start counting at one instead of zero. For that, we can also use the integer math node. And there we go. Now all the birches have a name from one to 16. So when I now duplicate the grid asset that we created, distribute a bunch of points on it, and then instance the birches that we generated on those, you can see here in the spreadsheet editor 
in the instances overview of the geometry that we are looking at, you'll see all of the instances and the name of the birch they are instancing. And here at the top, we have a hierarchy overview over all the geometry sets that are used. So this is our main geometry, which right now is unnamed, but we can, for example, set this name to forest and it pops up right there. And in the hierarchy, it contains all of the individual birches. But since all the different instances all reference the same 16 birches, in the hierarchy, only those show up. And here, the number on the side tells you how many times they are being instanced. And by clicking on these birches, you can inspect the geometry of the individual ones. So you can see here, all these individual birches don't have any instances, but they do have a mesh that we can inspect. So now with Blender 4.3, you can also inspect the hierarchy of instances in geometry nodes using the spreadsheet editor. So for example, birch one is instanced 66 times in the forest and the geometry of birch one that is being referenced these 66 times can be inspected here. With a new warning node, you can create your own custom warnings to allow the user to understand more about something going wrong. There are three different modes to this warning. It can either be a critical error, a warning, or just an info. How this node works is pretty straightforward, and the warnings get propagated up to the modifier level through all the node groups that you're using. There is one thing I do want to mention about this though. You may have noticed that there's also a Boolean output coming from the show input. This is essentially just a pass through and not actually required to get the right behavior working. The reason this exists is just to give you a tool to control when the inputs of this node are actually being evaluated. If you don't use it, it will always just be evaluated. So it might even happen in cases where the warning doesn't actually matter. So to give Blender more insight on what information in the node tree this warning is actually attached to, you can use the pass through to control whatever check you're doing with, for example, a switch node. So in the case that you're using the pass through, if the output of this switch node is not actually being used, Blender will just not even evaluate the inputs of the warning node. This is usually not super important, but it's useful for you to know when you're optimizing your node tree. Another big new feature that is more important than it might seem on the surface is the ability to pack bakes for simulation nodes. Previously, when using simulation nodes, you always had to store the cache on disk after you baked everything out. Now that is no longer necessary. By default, everything will just be packed into the blend file. This is especially useful, for example, if you're just baking a single frame of the evaluation. You might want to do that for performance reasons, for example. So after a big chunk of the node tree is not going to change anymore, you can just add a bake node set to still and then just bake it into the packed data of the blend file. That way, the next time you load up the blend file, all of the nodes before don't need to evaluate anymore because everything is just cached into the blend data. You can select whether to store the data on disk or packed on the modifier level and the node instance level. By default, the node instance just inherits the behavior from the modifier. There is one more huge topic that I've been kind of avoiding so far because it's a bit separate from geometry nodes. The elaborate rewrite of the Grease Pencil feature in Blender now finally allows you to use geometry nodes on Grease Pencil data. This is a huge benefit because Grease Pencil has a lot of tooling functionality that was not previously possible just using curves. But essentially, what that means is that Grease Pencil, in terms of geometry nodes, is more or less just handled like curve data. So almost all of the nodes that previously used curves can now also work on Grease Pencil. The reason why I'm saying almost is essentially just that Grease Pencil, besides what curves store in data, also has the functionality of layers. So in the context of geometry nodes, Grease Pencil can mainly be understood as instances of curves rather than curves directly. If you really want to treat Grease Pencil just like curves, you will first need to convert them. But there are nodes to convert back and forth from Grease Pencil to curves and backwards. So yes, now you can also just create Grease Pencil data from scratch in geometry nodes. Additional nodes give you the ability to merge Grease Pencil layers based on their name or an a group ID. The name of the layers in this case is using the same naming functionality that I've mentioned earlier in this video. But yes, since Grease Pencil data now essentially is just curved data under the hood, this opens up a whole new world of possibilities that have not been there before. 
So that's it for the big new features for Geometry Nodes in Blender 4.3. For a complete list of all the changes, also for all the other areas in Blender, make sure to check out the release notes page on blender.org. And I hope for Geometry Nodes, this gives you a better understanding of how to use the new features.